Hello and welcome to ESPN Crick and Post video cast and I'm really excited today. All my guests have been, you know, exciting people. They have given us some great uh, things to ponder on. But today I'm especially excited because I think this is for the first time in a I don't know whether this has happened before where a perfectionist has interviewed a perfectionist. Simon Toffel, <laughs> welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Sanjay, nice to be with you and uh, I'm not sure I'm entirely comfortable with that description but it really is nice to share some thoughts with you today and um, and really enjoy each other's company for a while. Yes, you know, you wrote a book, book recently, I wrote uh, mine a couple of years back and the perfectionism was addressed and I called it an Im- imperfection, you know, trying to be a perfectionist but you, you know, it's amazing how you can read people, maybe not 100% but from a distance, I've always seen Simon from a distance and you're always sort of turned out perfectly. Everything is right. Even when I used to say, hi, Simon, you would go, mm, you know, in your bubble. So I'm assuming that you're a bit of a perfectionist. And somewhat, I think it was revealed in your book as well. Well, I did try to be a perfectionist very early on in my career. And I got some really good feedback straight away to start that, you know, to know that I wasn't perfect, that I did make mistakes. And and of course, with the advent of feedback through technology and lots of video cameras and replays and all the experts in the commentary position, I was constantly reminded that I wasn't perfect. But um, <laughs> I did learn that we can't be perfect, but we can be excellent. So trying to manage those expectations is really, really important out on the cricket field. And more particularly, dealing with that away from the cameras and trying to keep things in perspective and context. So, for example, at the end of a day's play, if I walk off with 15 appeals in a day and I've got two wrong, that's probably not a great result in context. If I've got one wrong out of 15 and it's a really, really tough decision, while I'm disappointed, I'm not going to be overly hard and critical on myself despite what the commentary and the fans might say. I'm sure, Simon, you would have seen the respect for the umpires grow during your career. In fact, in school cricket, we used to go, how was that? And the umpire said, not out. He says, sorry, sir, sorry, sir. But basically, they want people that uh, were respected as But now, a Simon Toffel, when he walks into a cricket ground, people recognize him. He's treated like a celebrity, a star. So that has changed. People now understand the umpires are also one of the main actors out there in that play. And that job ain't easy. Well, the, all, all the participants are important, Sanjay, as we know that we can't have a game of cricket without three good teams and, and the quality of the contest needs to be first and, and foremost. And to do that, the umpires have got to do their job to a really high standard to keep the focus on the cricket. But within that, the scorers have really lifted their game. The umpires in the late 90s, as part of my generation coming through, we certainly got fitter. We were certainly younger. We had young kids or young families. Um, we sort of had middle management careers, generally speaking, so we were more professional in our psyche and, and preparation, if you like. And we started to change that generation of, while David Shepherd, a good friend and colleague of mine, you know, magnificent man, great umpire, etc., that image, that image of, you know, someone who was probably old enough to be my father or grandfather at the time, someone who, whose skin folds were very, very high, Uh, in comparison (laughs) and we're after a younger breed of you know eyesight and hearing but also approach you know trying to keep those man and match management skills to a professional level because the game was moving into a new era as well and we needed to move with the game so from a scoring and umpiring teamwork perspective we need to have three really high-performing teams to keep the focus on the players and the cricket because that's where it belongs. You know, the question that I have is why umpiring? I mean, there are so many other jobs around, uh, you know, the game. Uh, If you can't play, why umpiring? Because it's almost, when you started off, even more so a thankless job, really. Yeah, well, it's a good question. So, really, Sanjay, I'm an accidental umpire. I really only took up umpiring because of that injury and that player injury. I never really aspired to become a cricket umpire. One thing that cricket umpiring does offer you, and it's not for everybody, it really is a tough job. You know, and people say, how do you stand out there for for six or seven hours a day and concentrate for that long? Well, we don't concentrate for that long, but it certainly is, as you say, um, a thankless job. But funny enough, it is a very rewarding activity 
if you approach it in the right way. You know, a lot we, we, umpires think differently. We we are driven by the challenge of you know making correct decisions, but also managing a game of cricket, which you know when it's two against twenty two, and you've got competing teams and different personalities and weather conditions and you know forty two laws of cricket and even more playing conditions and a lot of those things that come into to the mix. It's a challenging it's a challenging vocation, but we do it because we love it. We do it because we have this enjoyment for the game and we want to add some value to cricket. So a lot of cricket umpires go out there and they're very much driven by fear. Fear of making a mistake. And, and you would say of, out of ten you you would say about six or seven out of ten would have that fear? Yeah, I'm thinking I'm nine to ten out of ten, Sandra. I'd say Sorry. nine to ten out of ten. Nine, nine out of ten, okay. Well. Out of ten. We're all driven by fear. You know, when we cross that white rope, you know, gee, I hope it really doesn't bowl from my end. Right arm around the wicket, pitching it in line, straightening it, LBW appeals, getting that one down the leg side. You know, we are driven by fear and, and fear of making a mistake and fear of criticism. Um, you know, if we don't have to make a decision, that's great, that's fantastic. We're not in the game. You know, we, we don't like criticism. We don't like getting things wrong. And no one, you know, we're, we are people first and umpires second. And no one likes to feel bad. No one likes to have their integrity questioned. No one likes to be criticised. For players, it's quite simple. You have your failures of feeling terrible. You want 100 or 5, you can haul you get it and you get adulation. But Simon Toffel has made a couple of mistakes and he has two or three great matches as umpire. But it doesn't make yep. the headline. So what's the reward when Simon Toffel has had a bad game but he's had like in 2005, I think England, New Zealand, which you mentioned in a book as well. You made some mistakes, uh, six errors in one match, and after that, four years consecutive, you were umpire of the year. So tell us, you know, what is the reward for players and commentators? It's, it, you get instant feedback and stuff like that. What's the reward for that kind of, you know, when you've uh, climbed that peak and uh, achieved what you set out to do? Um, people often ask me, what, what, what's the most enjoyable part of your job or what's the best part of the day? And I'll normally give them a couple of answers. Number one is when you walk off that field at the end of a long day and you ask yourself the question, if I had today over again, would I do it any differently? And if the answer is no, thumbs up. Now for me, what do I, how do I judge success and how do I, how do I sort of celebrate a day's play or a good game or what's my why? So I sort of touched on that a little bit around satisfaction. I think for us, it's a hygiene factor. When people aren't talking about you, you're not mentioning my name on the broadcast. My name is not on the back page of the Herald. It's not mentioned in the Crick Info description in a day's play. That's gold. And if we can keep the focus on the cricket and people aren't talking about us, and I would often say this to umpire groups in tournaments that I would help prepare for or offer some, some, uh, some direction and, and incentive and motivation for a good tournament, is that if you're standing out, chances are you're doing something wrong. You see, our role in the game is to keep the focus on the cricket. And if we deliver what the game expects, normally people are not talking about us. And so one of the things that I shoot for is absolute anonymity. Where a Billy Bowden, for example, <laughs> Billy wants to be the centre of attention, and that's great, and that's fine, and that's, that's his style, and that's his character, and I love him to bits, and he's a, he's a fantastic mate, and um, he's a challenge to work with, but he's a, good, <laughs> he's, a, he's a good umpire, and he's been a really good decision maker in his day. But we are diametrically opposed in our values around what good officials or, you know, what officiating should look like. You know, I want to be not the centre of attention. I want to keep the focus on the cricket and Billy's a character and that's him. And it's important for you to be yourself and to be authentic to who you are. And if you can walk off that field at the end of the day's play and say, I've given 110% today, I've done the best I could, I wouldn't change anything, that's gold. So my question is like a player, and I've used this line in commentary as well, that he, he's a bit out of form. Like there have been umpires who've had three good years and a couple of bad years. 
it's exactly like yeah. a player isn't it form coming in form out of form and again form is related to confidence if you uh, your confidence drops when you're out of form when they talk about bad patch your confidence is down same with the umpires i guess absolutely i mean umpiring is 99.9% of mental game and, and for us it's all about building that confidence through preparation building that self belief and having really good mechanisms in place where you reinforce what you've done well you reinforce and remind yourself why you're ready for this challenge understand that again as i said before you can't be perfect but you can be excellent we will get that one or two deliveries in a match that are just too good for us just like the players however when we make a mistake we don't get to go off the field and sit in the pavilion for half an hour or 2 hours and stew over the mistake you know and, and hide from view we've got to back up for the next ball and yep. you know in, in today's world of modern technology when when an umpire has to do that and change their decision and admit mistakes in front of millions and billions of people and then bounce back for the next delivery giving it your full attention and respect and not worrying about what happened in the past our mental toughness has to be so so good that we can deliver that next correct decision and and there in lies part of the challenge and as you said from a, an umpiring perspective we don't have the right of reply you get to see multiple replays see the decision dissected and then make a judgment call and whatever you decide as a commentator there is no accountability for what you say or do in relationship to that decision or that comment with us there is total transparency and accountability and that's fine that's the nature of the game we 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 accept that but sometimes commentary is unfair and umpiring is not about fairness it, it there is no fairness in umpiring you know, that's just part of the job lot but what we do and what i particularly search for is respect you know that we we're out there doing the best we can and through all of that preparation that hard work that meticulous planning the effort on the field of play your relationship and professionalism with the players and the participants generates that level of respect where as you would know as a former international player you will forgive the odd mistake you will forgive if the umpire is a good person and they're doing their best you will forgive the odd mistake but you will not forgive to and you will not forgive negligence or just poor effort i th- i guess commentators what they say it plays a big role in your whole psyche your performance because what happens with the paper work is internal you know the uh, the body that is responsible for assessing you will do their job but a commentator speaking on the cuff so is an umpire very careful uh, about uh, a commentator what he says is that the worst thing the worst thing that you get as umpire the criticism from the commentator remember i said umpires are people too um whenever we receive something that's not fair or justified or reasonable or rational of course you know we 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 feel that but the first feeling i would get would be disappointment or oh, gee why did he have to say that or why did she have to do that and um, the second thing is well normally it might come from a point of ignorance why, why didn't you just ask me or actually have you actually got any empathy for what we're going through and was that really justified and as i said there is no right of reply so for me uncontrollables you try to block that out you try to ignore it but it does you you're a person you have feelings it does have some impact on you but ultimately i you know a lot of you guys have been around sport for a long time you know the story you know how this thing works so simon tofu or any of the umpire you know you were one of the very best let's say an umpire makes a mistake second over of a test match in the morning and he knows he has blundered and i'm sure internally he's going through hell you see it on the giant screen these days you know forget about you knowing later at the break you see it right there what does he yeah. do what happens internally and what do the good umpires do and what do the bad umpires sort of you have to stuck them to you know i think one of the big c words that the players have looked for in the past and they still look forward to today is con- is consistency they look for consistency in a lot of different things and one thing i've learned about consistency from a guy like bob woolmer is that they want consistency but they don't want it all the time they only want it when it suits them yeah. but the big thing that i talk about today particularly with umpires would be composure mm-hmm. you know you use the word temperament i would use composure because composure today is the number one 
around being an effective third umpire that all of a sudden the focus is on you and you actually have to remain relaxed and calm and composed to be able to think clearly. It's the same when you make a mistake under DRS or something's gone pear-shaped on the field. You've got to have that clarity of time, buy yourself some time, use your colleague, use your mate, slow things down, regain control, which is another big C, to be in control of your own thoughts and emotions and not let it get overwhelming to the point where you just can't think clearly. So composure, composure, even though when you might be churning up inside, you have no idea with my facial expressions what's going on inside. Mm. And that's the type of confidence then you've got to portray to everyone who's watching you. I remember, I don't know whether you have that memory, but there was one decision, I think it may have been at the One Kelly Stadium, front foot defensive, and we showed it from front on. And you could see as the ball passed the bat from front on, two dimensions, you could see clear deflection. And keeper takes the catch, there's an appeal, Simon Sofal says not out. And instantaneously, you know, a lot of people who haven't done the job uh, often enough from the front on have concluded that there's an outside edge because of the deviation. It was one of the amazing moments where actually the deviation had come from the pad, from the back leg. Uh, it all happened so quickly, but from front on, you couldn't see that as much. But from side on, it was clear to see that there was another uh, sort of uh, uh, collision or impact that had caused the deviation and I remember telling you that but then I think you've trusted your sound uh, sort of uh, understanding. Right. Well, there are a number of other cues and information that we look for. So for example, what was the sound? What did it sound like? When did it come? What did the ball do after leaving the batsman? How quickly did it go? If it comes off the pad or the body, it'll tend to come off slower or loop more in the air. If it comes off the bat, it will tend to go more directionally and quicker. So sometimes if you're uncertain about what it might have done, you need to be able to look at those other pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that I would call them and try to make a better picture because, see the challenge for umpires is we get a very much a two-dimensional image. Yep. And in broadcasting, as you know now, we would use a split screen. We'll look at front on and we'll look at side on. As a cricket umpire, we don't get to see that. Yep. So yep. we have to develop other ways, other methods, to be able to make those still correct decisions, still looking at a two-dimensional image. And that's really, really challenging. And that's why you've got to learn as quickly as you can to look for other things to help you to get the right answer. It's an amazing sport. It's something that I've written as well, that it's, it's an outdoor sport. Two acres of cricket field and we are looking at little things. It's come down to millimetres now. You mentioned sound as being a very important factor to differentiate between bat and pad. Crowd, yep. Eden Garden, very noisy. Yep. All of the factors that when the actual bowler starts running in and delivers the ball, it is reasonably silent. Has that been yep. an issue at all for you to make out if there's an edge or not? Because we as players also get it. I mean, we are also in the same setting and we hear the bat and bat. So do we make more out of it? then the umpire would say, you know, it's not such an issue, we can hear it every oh, time. Oh no, question, in noisy environments, you know, the, the cards are stacked against a, a cricket umpire, oh, okay. a side, an outside edge or an inside edge or an LBW or a court down the leg side. There is no question that it is definitely harder and it's definitely more challenging. Uh, two things that I'd get you to think about. Number one is, um, as a cricket umpire, you actually physically have to remind yourself, today is a day where I, I don't, I can't expect to actually hear what I need to hear. So you've got to learn to trust these a lot more and these less. And when you tell yourself and you remind yourself that to trust your eyes, and if there's a ball going past the outside edge, you're looking and paying more attention to a deflection or to other information. And if there's no noise, you're not going to say not out because there's no noise, because remember today is a different game of cricket. Um, the second thing that I get you to think about would be it's amazing what you can hear when you're looking and watching for the right things. Why do I say that? It's because in a noisy environment, you still can hear some things. And it's just important to not think that the whole world is against you and give up. But when you are in the zone and you're doing more and thinking less, you actually will start to hear things that are reasonably normal.
I also know for a fact which you also would have experienced on your own. And once you get uh, the respect or you are acknowledged as one of the best umpires in the world, then the players are kinder, the media, the commentators, life gets a little easier. And I saw that actually happening with David Shepherd. This was in South mm. Africa, and Kapil Dev was brilliant. You know, he's a guy who worked hard for his wickets, but never appealed if he felt the batsman wasn't out. And there was this instance. Uh, somebody played off the front foot and Kapil Dev thought there's an outside edge and the keeper took the catch and Kapil Dev appealed and Kapil Dev only appealed if he thought he was out and never if the umpire said no you know he was fine but he genuinely felt the, the batsman was out so he went how was that and David Shepherd you know was a pretty expressive guy he said not out not out and Kapil Dev kept going because he had a good relationship with David Shepherd it was like a personal thing how was that how was that? it's like come on David that's out and i'll never forget this and then my heart went out to david shepherd and he said no caps he hasn't hit it caps he hasn't hit it so he was trusting by his own you know what he see and i could see kapil dev completely change he said caps mm. he hasn't hit it and it all just cooled down quickly mutual respect and in the end david shepherd was right that one hadn't hit it we talked about sanjay before that that objective of trying to gain respect and credibility from the participants and every time as a cricket umpire you go up a level whether some great cricket to first class first class to international international to ICC if you like what what your what your first immediate challenge is is to build familiarity with the stakeholders around you the players the media um uh, roomies the ground staff is to build familiarity where people feel comfortable in your presence they feel as though they at least know you because at the moment they don't and the only way that you can do that is is building familiarity with net sessions and and uh hotel chats and airline uh, bump in touch points etc but then you've got to build credibility through performance and when you start to do that you build what i call a bit of insurance as a match official the better you are and the longer you stay at a high level of performance the more insurance you actually buy from the broader stakeholders whether they be fans spectators broadcasters players coaches administrators you build a, a certain level of insurance now you don't take that for granted but when you get one or two of those instances where you need to sort of call on that insurance policy um they will come to the party and that's why I talked about the players will often to give one mistake but they won't to give two Uh, just in a nutshell, if you can tell us, umpiring before DRS, you retired in 2012, right? Uh, so DRS and yes. things would have come in, just about come in. And what has changed, and which uh, you think is the major change in umpiring on the field, with regards to you know DRS and uh, more encroachment of technology in the game? Well, DRS came in in 2008, and yeah. people might not know this, but my first DRS decision that I had was in New Zealand. um shortly after it came in and I actually got it wrong. Well, I had to change the decision. I disagreed with the decision or the technology, but I got it wrong and I had to change it. Um so I've seen both sides of it. Okay. Um th- there are two schools of thought here, Sanjay, and it depends on your officiating makeup about how you think about this stuff. For me, I take every decision personally and I take every decision importantly to get it right. So whether I make a mistake pre or post DRS is irrelevant for me that a mistake is a mistake. Uh the other school of thought with umpires a lot of umpires today is is that if the if the error gets fixed up everyone benefits the game benefits we can move on. For me I I still I still feel a mistake I still get upset about it I still feel yeah, terrible about it. Yeah because you don't want to this, do this it's like a report card isn't it everybody sees it. Yeah well, well it, it is it is you get instant feedback. So The officiating difference for me now is but pre DRS I could park it have a look at it later and then deal with it now I get instant feedback and you're having your decision dissected in in the space of a minute to two minutes and you're getting instant feedback and it makes it harder to move on mm. so all I I get concerned about DRS a little bit in this space for officiating is that just because we're able to fix the mistake in most cases and move on I want to make sure that we're still putting as much effort into getting the decision right in the first place. 
because the mistake has been fixed up and it's not being highlighted in the media, that there is still enough importance placed on the decision-making process to get it right before we need to use technology. Right, and you know, there's one, you know, controversies around umpiring decisions will never stop. You know, despite technology, there's always that no ball that somebody made. One only aspect of uh, DRS and technology is uh, umpire's call. Now, I've seen Virat Kohli on the field gets really frustrated by the umpire's call. Obviously, when it doesn't work for his team or works for, uh, doesn't get as frustrated when it works. But do the umpires of today still have a say on where the decision is going to go? Because they are they trained enough because you know they've been exposed to television replays and uh, DRS so much that they know this is likely to be an umpire's call. And then in their heads, they are going this way or that way. For me, umpire's call is not about benefit of doubt to the batsman, it's about benefit of doubt to the umpire. We're giving the umpire a little bit of margin because technology is not perfect. And, and so umpire's call is about this margin of error that may or may not exist in predictive path or point of impact. And it's really important that until we have perfection in technology, that we don't hang and crucify umpires for a fraction of millimetres. And remember what I said before about people want consistency but they don't want it all the time? Well, I'm sure Virat Kohli loves umpire's call when he's batting. Yes. But he probably hates it he's the fielding captain. Right, final question, Simon. Uh, and you touched upon it, uh, turning pitches in India. And I'm thinking, you know, for a foreign player, Dicky Bird struggle, I mean, towards the end of his career, to be fair to him. But I'm thinking people who have actually played and umpired a lot in those conditions would have a certain advantage. So why not have an Asian umpire or an Indian umpire in test matches on turning pitches because he's got a better idea? But then neutral umpires came for a reason, third country umpires came for a reason. But today's day and age, when everything is out there in the open, an umpire, if he shows an element of bias or makes bad mistakes, his brand value or you know his future as an umpire is at stake. So do you think we have now turned the corner and we might see more same country umpires umpiring in test matches and 50 years cricket? Uh, look, the beauty of this question and this answer is, Sanjay, there's no right answer. So whatever I tell you, it doesn't really matter, um, but it'll just be a different perspective. I think, having sat on the ICC Cricket Committee for several years, whenever we talked about this issue of home country umpires and, and non, it was all about taking that perception of bias off the table. And whenever we talk about decision-making the game of cricket and umpires, if we're not talking about a decision because of where someone's come from, that's a good thing. If we're just talking about the decision itself and focusing on the issue, not the person, then that's a good thing. Whenever we start clouding that discussion, that debate around neutrality, around parochialism, favoritism, etc., we're back to where we started 20 odd years ago, 30 years ago, before the ICC panel came into fruition. Yeah, but now the, and, um, um, the mistakes would be, you know, seen quite clearly, the bias would be seen immediately and it would actually, the umpire, you think from the umpire's point of view, he doesn't want to aid his own team by a certain decision because he knows his career as a long-term career as an umpire is in jeopardy now. Because there's some, so never, much upset Jay, and there's so career. many credit and debit points. Yeah, go ahead, Simon. Just yeah. Jay, in my career, I've never seen an umpire who I thought was a cheap or was yep. giving favourable decisions. And this is what really hurts me around the subcontinent view is that, as you say, in today's world, there is so much transparency about decision-making and there are processes in place in Dubai where every decision is checked and assessed and fed back to not just the umpire themselves, but you as an ICC umpire selector and the, the board chief executives so that everyone gets to see what the decision-making transparency is. There is no way in the world that an umpire would ever would ever sell out their credibility and integrity for the sake of a decision. And then the RS as well, isn't it? Just imagine a situation if somebody suddenly gets very patriotic on the big stage, there is DRS for the opposition to challenge that decision. So I think maybe the time has come to have, because I think one of the struggles is to find good quality umpires and so many matches happening around the world. I don't know, the future is now uncertain with COVID, but who knows? So. Well, it is, Sanjay, but on this topic very quickly, yeah. what's really important is we don't think that umpiring is all about decisions, that we really celebrate focus on the soft skills, 
on the communication, on the man and match management of the contest, if you like, and the environment, the ability to apply ground light with consistency and accuracy, and that players actually feel comfortable that they've got high standard officiating and that officiating is not just about the hard skills and the hard decisions, it's actually about the people skills. And when you, you think about the names of the officials that you've mentioned today, yes, they've been good decision makers, but what sets them apart is that ability to go from good to great because of their soft skills. I mean, you did the World Cup final 2011, the semis as well, but I, I, in your book you've written, the toughest game for you was India-Pakistan Mohani. <laughs> yeah. Why was that? Yeah. To finish it. Everything. everything. You've, got, you've got the two prime ministers, you've got the airport full of all the, the Bollywood stars, you've got yourself in the expert commentary position, everyone wants to be there, um, everyone's watching TV, the hotel's mad, um, the journey to the ground is chaotic, uh, and it's just a game of cricket. And it's funny when we talk about this game, everything inside the rope seems to be pretty simple and seems to be pretty normal. And all the stuff outside the rope tends to be complicated and not simple. But, you know, it's just a game of cricket. But on a serious note, I mean, just imagine, I'm talking to the fans now, that here's an umpire, top class umpire, and if he has five great matches where he's, it's like equivalent to a batsman getting 500. And what is it that they get as reward is nobody talks about them. That's the ultimate high for an umpire. So it's a tough job meant for only few who are looking for some kind of spiritual gratification. I don't know what that is. But Simon, thank you very much for your time and thanks for enriching our game and continue your good work. And this thing that you've done in your WhatsApp as well, I saw that em emoji and I made a note of it. So thank you very much. Let's end on a number two. Take care. That's it. Anyone. Thank you. <laughs>